Oh, hello there. I'm David Woods from Bruin Report Online, the UCLA site on the 24-7 Sports Network. And I'm Ryan Abraham. Hello there. From uscfootball.com, uh, the USC site on the 24-7 Sports Network. And together, I just got to let you guys know, we make the podcast for champions. And what we do is we talk Pac-12 football. No, we talk all things Pac-12 football. All things Pac-12 football. You missed some words. I did. But I added some. So it's we, so dry here. Guys, it's very dry. I want you to understand the trials and travails. It is so dry. Uh, there are uh, four people in my household. Three of them have had either nosebleeds or bloody boogers today. Yeah. This is the kind of travesty we're dealing with. And I want you to understand the circumstances upon which we are recording this show. Southern California is like a desert that we just put cement over, right? Like Correct. Are, yeah. I mean, I think that's technically the case. Um, yeah, we got a fun show for you. We had uh, fun? Six, six games. Sure. A lot of stuff going on. I was at a game that 99 points were scored. Yep. There were some games where an offensive touchdown wasn't scored. Yep. Um, game day might have been there. We got fun stuff. And we got a lot of people uh, watching us live on our YouTube channel. Which we are like this close to 1,500 subscribers. So just uh, subscribe over there. Like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Uh, a lot of comments already in the uh, chat. Anything good here? I'll kind of like look at uh, some of these. But I would guess, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a fun show, I think. I think it'll be fun. I mean, it's, it's you know, whether, whether it's fun or not is going to depend, I think, a lot on your performance. Oh, really? Um, I think that's going to dictate a lot of this. But... I'm ready to bring the fun, as I always am. We're going to bring the fun. We want some super chats. Uh, super chat. We got some fun. Super so chat. I did a podcast super yesterday. Chat. Yeah, we did some yesterday. We'll put your comments right to the top. Uh, I mean, they were like, they weren't big, like five bucks and things like that. So yeah, just do that. That's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, humidifier truthers in the chat so far. Humidifiers are bullshit. Okay. Really? Until you've lived in a really dry climb, you may not understand that. But when you are in a period of incredible dryness, a humidifier is just something you do to pretend like it's helping. It doesn't help. It's bullshit. Humidifiers are nice in like any kind of normal client. If you've got like a baby, that's nice. But yep. if you're actually like, trying to combat, like, let's say, we're, what this feels like right now to me is like on the east side of the Sierras when you're in that like caldera of like just absolute dryness. That's what this feels like to yeah. me. And a humidifier doesn't cut that at all. You need to actually like just be immersed in water like Luke Skywalker in a Bacta tank to feel mm -hmm. any kind of moisture in your body. Get out of here with your fucking humidifiers wow okay david coming strong with the humidifier. i've got a headache i'm 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 not feeling well let's go you don't look good to be fair thank you I never mean, i never do comparatively it's about the same but you just don't usually look good so uh all right well hey you guys want to get a hold of us pack podcast at gmail.com is the email address you can call or text us we got a couple voicemails including we got the zodiac killer oh my in. god yeah four, coming two, four. out of hiding 424-532-0678. Maybe parole. I'm not sure. Do they parole like multiple murderers? Maybe not. Um, you can also tweet us at Pac-12 Podcast and the website where all of our content is uh, Pac-12Podcast.com. Go check it out. And of course, over in the Apple Podcasting app, we love to get reviews. Five-star reviews are amaze balls. Do we got any new ones, David? We have no new ones. Oh, man. People have failed. We failed us. You know what didn't fail? What? Our picks this week. Four and two. We got screwed by one. It should have been five and one. <laughs> we were really off on one. But the other ones were like, we had underdogs winning. We had all it going. And, uh, you know, so it was a good weekend for me over at my bookie. So when your money's on the line, and it was this week for me, you want to choose a trusted sports book that will give you the tools to win, like my bookie. They helped me a lot. In my bookie, it doesn't matter if your team is up or down. You can easily cash out or bet the game live to come out on the winning side. You can use my bookie for daily odds boosts, same game parlays, and you can take advantage of huge prize pool contests. Plus, they have a no strings attached cash bonus. Yeah, first deposit, use promo code PAC12, and you can get that said cash bonus in there. Uh, it's great. Up to you can uh, your first deposit, you can get up to two hundred dollars in cash. So use promo code PAC12 and you can get your cash bonus right now. Remember, you can bet anything, anytime, anywhere 
only over at my bookie. And, Loved uh, it. It was a good weekend. I missed a damn parlay because of your Bruins, David. But I gave you all the information you needed to pick that one correctly. True. You just picked UCLA. I so picked I UCLA. So you had all of the information you needed to pick the other way, and you chose not to do that. And that's more of a you problem than a me problem. Yeah, that was definitely me. Yeah. Um, um, so just went with the I am now, uh, for those keeping track at home, I am now one in six on UCLA games against the spread this year. Yes, I cover the team. Yes, I realize that's very funny. Uh, I am, I think at last count, I am 66% correct on all other Pac-12 games. That's crazy, yeah. Yeah. No, doing good. We're both significantly over 500. You still got me by three games. I could have picked up a game if I just went against you and UCLA. But it was a good week for us, uh, picking the Pac-12. Called a couple home dogs, and they end up winning. Um, so hopefully we'll they'll be able to keep that going uh, this weekend. It should be some interesting games. But we got to recap everything that happened. Any kind of newsy stuff you want to get to, David? Or Newsy stuff? Yeah. Anything, like, you know, you love when there's like talking about the pack two or lawsuits i know you get into that stuff you're that's right. so true that's so true um, no i mean i've been reading as much as i can all weekend about all of that but uh really nothing i want to share with everyone out here okay um well why don't we do this let's do our what we call pack 12 roundup yeah yeah baby so we got new um new rankings we do uh we spent a lot of time going over these too like really five, painstaking five minutes before yeah no five minutes before but we did it for i mean how long have we been sitting here two three hours <laughs> yes i mean we reviewed film uh i mean it was like a college football playoff committee meeting yeah um not quite no uh but it's weird you know uh it's just it's hard to kind of rank these teams because survivor pool Update. oh we got to talk about the survivor pools yeah i'm sorry thanks about scott that. uh is he in there yeah yeah so matthew uh sent us the results, remember back when we started, 355 entries. We are down to 28. Who's still alive among us two? You there, are alive. Got to be one of us, right? You both are alive. of us, Both of us probably, right? Nope, just you. We're the two Pac-12 experts, though. Stanford beat Colorado. That's the that's how I got screwed. Um, okay, 28 winners. Eight people at Arizona State. Seven had UCLA. Seven had USC. Woo, a close one. Um, five had Washington and one had Oregon. The losers, most everyone, seven had Washington State, someone had Oregon State, and two people didn't pick. So you make it all this way, and you didn't pick. Um, eight people took a gamble on Arizona State, and it paid off. Most of them are probably still screwed, but they can uh, brag to their friends for a week. This is Matthew's notes. Um, of the 28 players, eight have picked neither Stanford nor Arizona State. So he says, what are you waiting for? You're doomed. That said, we have one player, it's called Dave's Waffles, who has taken both Stanford and Arizona State, so it gives him a huge advantage, except his remaining picks include Colorado and Washington State. Uh, I really like what you got left, David. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but USC has joined Utah as the team to have been taken by every remaining player, so no more picking USC. Um, there's only two teams left that are still available to be chosen by more than half the field, Stanford and Washington State. Uh, only four players have taken Stanford and five have taken Washington State, and nobody's taken both. Um, there's 13 different combinations available uh, for you to pick for of, the, of the 28 survivors. Um, nobody still has two ranked teams left, uh, though two still have both Oregon and Arizona. And he says, ask me, how, do I, how strong do I feel David's chances of winnings are? David has Stanford, Washington State, and Oregon State left. But the cool thing is, all of these involve Stanford. Right. Stanford, Washington State and Oregon State both play Stanford. So yes. you can pick them in order. And then I have to pick Stanford to beat Cal. Yeah. And that's, you know, yeah. about as about as good, good of a chance, chance as you can hope for with Stanford at this point in the season. Right. So I yeah, I kinda like your chances here. Yeah, I feel pretty good. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's that I think bad. I'm in good position. Yeah. Um yeah, so I uh, yeah I like it. So, but yeah, thank you, Matthew, for compiling all of that. It's uh, definitely getting fun here uh, in the latter half of the uh, latter part of the schedule and all that. Uh, okay, so we do have to do our Pack Twelve Roundup. All right, uh, our number twelve team, Stanford Cardinal. 
they were involved in a bit of a tussle. A bit of a say. tussle. Yeah, with uh, our now number two team. Uh oh, Washington Huskies. <laughs> Yeah, I think a bit of a tussle doesn't really do this one justice. Um, <laughs> Stanford could have won this game. Yeah. Uh, Washington ended up winning 42-33. Um, they dropped from number one to number two by virtue of only winning this 42-33. to uh, This was a very, 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 very competitive game. Mm. Uh, Stanford, I, I, I mean... They had two opportunities late in this game. Um, they picked off uh, Washington uh, in the end zone and then turned it over on downs on the next play. Then Washington scores, and it's, you know, 136 to go. They turn it over on downs again. Um, for most of this second half, for most of this game, it was it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Stanford scoring uh, just at kind of any opportunity. Ashton Daniels, who played a... Um, very poor game against UCLA uh, was back to kind of what he did against, uh, I think it was Colorado, um, playing really, really well, running the ball really well. Stanford had almost 500 yards of total offense against Washington. And if you're looking for like one major reason to be concerned, if you're Washington, oh boy, you can't give that up to Stanford. They gave up 500 to Cal too. That's crazy. Uh, Michael Penix apparently was a little bit hurt or not a little bit hurt, a little bit sick, um, during this game. So that might've played a role in him not being super sharp, especially early on. Um, but offense saved him. Uh, they were able to put up enough points, but if they've got some things to figure out now, cause this is now back to back weeks of just kind of play from Washington and against ASU, it was the offense against Stanford. It was the defense, but they got to figure some things out if they're actually going to win this league because Oregon has responded to that game, that Washington game, by just uh, setting everyone else on fire. <laughs> and Washington has responded to it by laying uh, a couple of near eggs here. And th it's not a completely unrealistic world where they lost both of the last two games. So th they've got some stuff to figure out now. Uh, we have a complaint. A complaint. That the do. Kyle says, number two, eight and oh, and beat seven and one Oregon. LOL, head-to-head -head and better records doesn't matter. This is a power ranking. Okay. Are you frozen, David? Because you're in the room with me. I'm right here. Oh, okay. I'm just reading the comments. Oh, okay. Well, I, I just read it for you. Yeah, I'm reading I'm reading what else Kyle has to say. I want to see if he has to if he's gonna justify himself at all. So it's a power ranking. Like on a neutral field, who would you pick to beat the other if they played today? Like, we would both be picking Oregon right now, the way these teams are playing. Yeah, no question about it. Um, yeah, I mean, Washington, look, they're finding a way to win these games. But um, if you play a competitive game against Stanford, sorry, you're dropping. Like, I've watched I've watched Stanford. I'm familiar with the team. If you are playing competitively against them, you're not very good right now. Now, Washington may get back to being very good. They certainly have that potential. But right now, no, no, no. No, yeah. no. And Matthew's saying it was a home. It was home uh, by three, right? That's pick them on a neutral field. That's be going into the game. We've seen what happens after that game. Yes, Washington won, but we've seen what Oregon's done and we've seen what Washington's done. They could have lost all of those games. Um, I appreciate Jordan try, George trying to provide um, a little uh, uh, like rationale uh, to our ratings here, like we're doing something different, but. You're right, George. That is the difference between ratings and rankings. That uh, rankings are uh, telling you what you've done. Ratings are this is what we think they should do. But we did spend about two and a half minutes compiling these ratings this week. True. So, but I think it's fair. Like we look, we look at Oregon and think they're a better team right now. Yeah. Well, they're again, they're annihilating teams. Yeah. Set them on fire. And we'll see. That can change every week. But we'll go with that. Um, yeah. This was. We both got this right. We took Stanford plus 26 and a but half. But again, I thought it was going to be a different kind of thing. Like each of ASU and Stanford, I thought it was going to be a thing where it's a crazy backdoor cover. Each game, super competitive from the opening kick to the end of the game. Um, it was really just, you know, Washington uh, didn't sputter as much on the last couple of drives as Stanford did. Yeah. But it could have been a one-score game at the end. And it was like Stanford had a pick early on that got wiped off because of an offsides penalty. The fourth and two trick play, did you see that yes. one? 
where it's like it's fourth and two. Let's let somebody who's not our quarterback throw a ball. Actually threw it okay, but the receiver sort of was like stumbling backwards and had to reach forward and just dropped it. I mean, yep. it was a wide open. He was wide open. So I get. I mean, I started to Connor totally wide open too. Like or no, it's Chris Trevino. was like he's like the, tri- the play worked. I'm like it didn't work. But I mean, he was open. He should have caught the ball. He didn't catch the ball. It seems it was, like, by the way, there's an epidemic of this thing going on where on like fourth and twos or on two point conversions. Yeah that coaches just constantly are making running backs or wide receivers throw the football instead of the quarterback. And it's like, it's not an entirely different sport on a single down play to get a conversion. Like, it really isn't. Yeah. Just run your stupid offense that's been working. Have Ashton Daniels just, like, take the snap, survey the field, and then run for it. Like, there's... it. The sport isn't fundamentally changing just because it matters more to you. Just call your usual shit. That's what Oregon was running into, too, on their uh, uh, fourth down plays against Washington a few weeks ago. Just call your usual stuff. It works really well. And in this game, Stanford's usual offense was working fine. You don't need to do anything elaborate. And yes, was the play designed well and was he open? Sure. But don't have your receiver throw the football. Yeah, you have a receiver throw the football and a guy trying to catch a ball from a non-quarterback. And he, it made it to him and it was like near his waist, but... It was like the receiver had to like come back for the ball. Like if he was running and he was catching the ball, like they're probably going, that's probably going for like a touchdown or something. Yeah. Uh, that was weird. Washington was pretty like efficient, right? They were 50% on their third down conversions. Um, but I think Stanford, they turned the ball over twice. Stanford didn't turn it over at all. Um, Stanford did a better job. You know, they forced two turnovers in the red zone, uh, two more field goals. So it was like six trips to the red zone. You only get two touchdowns out of it where Stanford, they didn't get there as much. They weren't as efficient on third down, five of 15. But they got three touchdowns out of their four trips to the red zone and then one field goal. So I feel like they made the most of their opportunities. But they missed some – they just missed some spot. You know, they missed some spots here. 499 yards, 5.8 yards per play. Like, this is not another – it's another kind of poor effort by Washington's defense. We saw Cal put up 502 yards against them. Um, you know, I th- did uh, Eric Aomanor like – he? It looked like he got hurt later. Like he caught this crazy ball and landed on his shoulder. I didn't see if he was out after that. I didn't see him um, come back in. But yeah, he was having a great game. Alec. 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 I'm sorry. Come on. Eric. Alec. And then uh, they have another new dude like Tiger uh, Bachmeyer. Bachmeyer. Yeah. He's uh, been like amazing the last two games. They did nothing like the first six or whatever. So yeah, I mean, they're running out of like their their good receivers. I mean, they're already down Eurosec and uh, John Humphreys has not played in many many weeks now um so hopefully i am is is healthy because i'm gonna need stanford to beat cal in a few weeks yeah you're gonna need that yeah. um uh, jalen polk you know another huge game uh he had a 92 yarder in this one uh five receptions 148 yards two touchdowns he was targeted 11 times so didn't but um yeah i mean he had some huge plays in this one yeah. like stanford gave up like a 92 yard touchdown and you're like come on um but they covered easy you know we got this one right um, but yeah, Stanford had a real chance to win this one and they weren't able to pull it off. Okay. Uh, we got our number 11 team, California golden bears. <laughs> Just put the, the future of the ACC down the bottom of this one. Uh, and they were hosting our number six team, USC Trojan. <laughs> you know, I think this is really just, it shows the heart of a champion. Um, mm from USC here uh coming back two scores down against a tough tough Cal team super tough one of the uh toughest guttiest three and five teams you're ever gonna see Mm. um and for USC to show that kind of heart that toughness that mental um I don't know I mean just that mental fortitude it's just a real testament I think not only to Lincoln Riley the head coach but also Alex Grinch um the defensive coordinator um, to buckle down and hold this Cal offense to only 21 second half points after <laughs> allowing four to 28 in the uh, in the first half. That's I mean I, I'm not a I, look I'm not a math guy right, but that's that's 75 percent of what they allowed in the first half. That's improvement. Huge improvement. And you're doing that when you're tired. You're up in the hostile confines of Berkeley, California, where, you know, 
fans sometimes do show up to the games um and and you're you're putting together that kind of second half showing now, i don't know about you i don't know about all the speculation about lincoln riley potentially going to the nfl but if ever there was a live audition for head coach for usc i think this was it obviously uh alex grinch what a second half um usc won 50 to 49 uh they beat they beat the sturdy golden bear um would you call this one so i don't know because i was trying to assess the message board i was taking temperature of the parastyle uh at different points of this game because i will say to all of you on the parastyle please keep doing what you're doing it's a fun time for us uh as as uh people from other uh teams to watch uh the things that happen there during the game uh some consternation mid-game as you might expect um but i was trying to take the temperature what, what the feeling was after this game because if I was a USC uh, supporter, um, I would have taken this as a classic moral loss uh, in that you won, but you absolutely should have lost, and your team's maybe dog shit. Um, but it didn't seem like that was entirely the temperature on the message board, so I'm interested in that. And then the other one that we really have to discuss, and this is important, uh, the Pac-12 was a beautiful thing. And uh, we are going to miss these kind of seminal moments, these great, uh, beautiful times in, um, in just Pac-12 lore, like uh, when, uh, say, say the final play of the first half ends uh, with um, a receiver for USC falling down roughly at the, like, tenth of a second mark, right? But he's within somewhere uh, the range of a field goal. And a head coach spends, I don't know, between five and ten minutes on the field at halftime pleading his case while the refs let everyone go back into the locker room. Then they pull Justin Wilcox out, and he loses his mind. And then we get to see the end of the first half as the first play of the second half. That was a beautiful moment. Um, and then truly my favorite part of that was after they come out and they're you know, and people are talking, oh, God, they really shouldn't let him practice that kick over and over. This is an unfair advantage. And then Justin motherfucking Wilcox uses one of his first half timeouts, again, here at the beginning of the second half, to ice him. <laughs> and was. then he misses. <laughs> and then USC somehow still wins the game. Everything about this game was just a beautiful showcase of Pac-12 football. No notes. I want to watch it again. It was, it was very Pac-12. Yes. I mean, the game started, people are putting in the chat. With a protest mm -hmm. at midfield, mm -hmm. you would think I was like with my binoculars up there trying to see it. It was just as four and I couldn't tell. And it's for this, I guess now former Cal professor, Yvonne, something, I don't know her last name, who uh, was charged with uh, stalking a fellow professor. We've all been there. Yeah. Uh, keying his car, um, going, showing up at his mother's house. I guess some threats were made or something and. She did a lot of not cool things that you wouldn't want to do to a colleague, admitted to doing those things, said something about like she needed to get help and she wasn't getting the help she needed. But anyway, she suspended and there was like 12 students on the field, right? You know, after the coin toss, everyone's ready to like kick off and get this going. And they just sit on the field with their t-shirts. And you thought it was like, oh, this is going to be like something you know major world event no it was like for the suspended professor that jackson has an important comment oh let me see it was usc students protesting justice for grinch i uh, could have been yeah um, and i and i do I, I read I, what it was no but i take this for what uh, jackson means which is justice for grinch because he's been unfairly maligned uh by so many in the usc community yes given his uh, obvious improvement in the second half of this game. Look, yeah. the numbers the numbers speak for themselves. 28 first half, 21 second yeah. half. That means if they played two more halves, by, by the fourth <laughs> half, they'd be at seven points. Pretty amazing. That's a blowout. <laughs> but you that, just got to give them time to work. Yeah. But Change the rules, okay? Sure. Okay. 120 minutes. All right, that's all he needs. That's okay. Okay. Uh, the protest was really funny. Uh, very Cal. Like, it was just very, like, for the last weekender, like, this was, like, it made sense. Like, that's, if you've never been there and you're walking up, 
you know, through Fraternity Row and there's bed sheets hanging from the fraternity houses. Like the, the fraternity, ho fraternity houses are pumping at 10 in the morning. It's just like, boom, like it's, it's like a club, you know, like FUSC, you know, spray painted on bed sheets hanging up. Like it's a, it's a thing going to the game. You might've been walking from BART or you're parking from somewhere, um, get dropped off by Uber, whatever you're doing. But from like, the BART? The BART station? The BART station, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Just because you're visiting doesn't mean you have to adopt the lingo. You're like those soccer fans who start talking about kits. I don't th I don't talk yeah. about kits. Uh, but I call it BART. I don't know. It's the BART. The BART. Okay. The Bay Area Rapid Transit. Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, but that's like, the, it's like the whole kind of experience. But having the, the um, protest and all that stuff, the Duffel halftime thing was great. And I got the... Lincoln Riley took three questions after this stupid game. But I, I asked him the one about, hey, what happened at halftime? And he, like, sits back and kind of crosses his legs like he's going to, like, you know, uh, tell, you know, uh, spin some yarn, which he did. And uh, he had mentioned, he's like, you didn't even talk about the, the pregame protest. He goes, that's California for you. And then went off. Uh, and he said, he said the referees did the right thing because basically there were, the call in the field was the time it expired. And then Lincoln Riley's like, okay, well, if that's the case, I can, uh, I have a timeout left. I can, um, you know, call for the review. And so, but he said that from, they were called from above. The the referees were said, send everybody in. So they send everybody in. He's, you know, it's like 10 minutes that they're talking. The Cal band, like on the same field of 41 years The band years is on ago, the field. The, but not the Stanford band. This was the Cal yeah. band literally performing. And then the referees are making an announcement. So we're in the press box. And I'm like, there's a band performing. And the referee is telling me what's supposed to have been happening. And in lieu of, they said, well, we don't want to bring everybody back. So we'll just bring them back out before the third quarter starts, you know, the end of halftime, and run an untimed down. And like you said, Dennis Lynch could practice the exact kick because kickers come out early before in games and, and halftime and they can just practice stuff, but they don't know what they're going to be doing. Certainly not the first play of the game be, or the first, the last play of the second, the first half kicking the exact field goal that you were going to be kicking. Like literally practice. Like if you're practicing a putt over and over again, cause I'm about to go into a, the, the tournament stop that I'm just going to go do this putt now to try to win the tournament. He misses the kick. After, Wilcox be, calls after being iced. A, yeah, Wilcox calls a timeout, and we're like, timeout, Justin Wilcox. But this was for the first half. It wasn't for the second half. It was just so freaking bizarre. And I've talked to a lot of coaches, players. I, I don't think anyone's ever seen anything like that before, which yeah. is very Pac-12. Yeah, I asked uh, Chip Kelly about it today, and he said uh, – Oh, yeah, I saw the quote. I think, yeah, I think no, is. we actually saw that before the game because the TV was on. I've never heard of that before. That's a first. There's a lot of firsts in Pac-12 officiating. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah um the we other the other a fun lot of pitch jokes now like we, i'm glad they cleared the pitch after the yeah, protest yeah. you're getting all the soccer the other crap. fun one was on the two-point try so justin wilcox um after they gack away a two touchdown lead in the second half we should talk about the actual game uh they gacked oh. away a two touchdown lead in the second half and then they do uh score uh down 43 50 uh they score to make it 50 to 49 and then they go for two properly. Um, I and thought they, it was a good, good call. And they call a nice little play. And then the Pac-12, uh, being the Pac-12, allows uh, the USC defenders to just mug the receivers, which was nice. Well, uh, Eric Jetcher was holding the tight end that was coming across. Right. But then Jalen Smith made a play on the ball. He didn't, mm -hmm. he didn't in fact, the receiver, but there was oh, okay. a hold in front of him. I got a picture of it right up there. You can see That's it. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, that was fun. It was a good time. And... Uh, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but I think the real, again, uh, heart of a champion, USC, I think it's it's just all um, it's all gravy from here. You know, you you, you beat the mighty Golden Bear. Um, I think, you know, season's a success at this point. Uh, Jay Knott was amazing. Uh, 153 yards. Uh, he had a 61-yarder, and I think it was a 43-yarder. This was... Fernando Mendoza's best game, uh, 292 yards, two touchdowns. He ran uh, for two touchdowns. See, what um, can you expect from Alex Grinch? Because Fernando Mendoza wait, wait, had, real had, stuff I'm talk about. He had his best game. Okay, so you're done for that. Um, okay. <laughs> Cal had five trips into the red zone. We don't we don't have time to just you troll the entire time. You've already trolled. You're done trolling. Um, so. 
write something. Yeah. Uh, five trips to the red zone, scored five touchdowns. Cal turned the ball over four times to USC's one, and USC won by a point. Like, Cal should have won this game. USC scores 21 points in the fourth quarter uh, to get the win, but it was crazy. I mean, Ott had a huge game, and Mendoza had a huge game. Um, yeah, USC did run the ball more. They ran the ball with their running backs 26 times. Marshawn Lloyd had a really big game. But uh, I thought Cal's defense, which has been terrible, played a little bit better. I mean, they, they, and this was all drives, David. This wasn't like yeah. USC turned the ball over. Every drive was like, I mean, it's crazy. So if you look at the drives, you have four touchdowns in a row, 75 yards, 75 yards, 66 yards, 50 yards, 75-yard TD drive, 54-yard TD drive, 79-yard TD drive. Like, Cal drove the ball and had a lot of success. They sure did. They sure did. Um, but I would say, again, Alex Grinch, the adjustments he made in the second half. Hey, no, no, I got a point. I got a I got you an have, important you have two point. seconds to make this point or you're done for like a half an hour. They shut down the run. Uh, second half. Second half shut down the run. Run was shut down a little bit. They did. Now, is that because Jay Knott um, got his got his bell rung real good at some point in the second half? He might have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they shut it down. Um, every, th- every running back they had besides Jay Knott really didn't do much at all. Uh, Afonso, who's been pretty good, was uh, held in check. Really, it's just one good player. Um, Alex Grinch, I think, really could have... Uh, could have done something if it wasn't, you know, just going against a superstar running back. Yeah, they didn't have Bear Alexander for the first half too because he had a uh, targeting call in the uh, in the Utah game. So, so you're saying, hang on. So you're saying with one hand tied behind his back, Alex Grinch held them to 28 points in the first half. I know. A Jake Spavital coached <laughs> offense. He held them to 28 points. Cal, like Cal's offense has been like they scored 40 on Oregon State. They had 500 yards against Washington. They just did better than both of that against USC's defense. <laughs> like, their high water marks, like, if you're talking about, like, wow, Cal's offense did score 40 against Oregon State. Well, they beat it at 49. The most points they've ever scored in a loss, by the way, for Cal. And then blew away the yards total, too. So, uh, yeah, USC's defense was poo-poo. Yeah, Cal treated them Cal, like North Texas. <laughs> Cal should have won. Like, literally, Cal should have won. Um, yeah. But they did not. So, USC's still, like, second place in the conference. <laughs> Uh, but they got three ranked teams coming up, so we'll see what happens there. Okay, next up, we've got number 10. Arizona State Sun Devils. <laughs> and uh, who were they playing? Oh, yeah, we got, uh, I don't know why we have them there. Number eight. <laughs> Washington State Cougars. Uh, just predictable. We we literally predicted it. In fact, I predicted uh, a thirteen point win in my little picks column I do every week. And yeah. they ended up winning by eleven. The spread was Washington State by five and a half. Yeah, we both were all over that. We both got um, the Cal game right too. We took Cal plus ten and a half. Yeah, and we so, took Arizona State plus five and a half here as well. So ASU got its first conference win, thirty eight twenty seven. Its first FBS win of the year. They beat Southern Utah in their first game. Mm. Um, They've been close, though. They've been really close, and this was finally kind of the breakthrough. Um, and just, you know, they the thing was, like, they looked like a good team they did. In, in this game. Like, they looked and like I, a good team sometimes. I think they were playing, like, their 95% level game, like, playing, like, at pretty much peak performance on in all phases. But they looked good when they're doing that. Like, when they play, I mean, it's it sounds stupid, but, like, there are bad teams where even if they play well, they're going to get got by... You know, even teams playing mediocre, their good is actually okay. Like their good would be fine in this league, um, and it's been fine in this league basically since uh, they got shut out by Fresno State at home. Um, but yeah, Scadabo was great. Um, he had uh, what was his total touch rate? Okay, so he had one uh, reception, but he had twelve touches for 121 yards and a touchdown. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, you'll take that. Uh, DeCarlos Brooks was really good. Um, Elijah Badger was good. Um, Elijah Badger had a rushing touchdown, which was cool. Uh, Trenton Bourget was like his usual like kind of game management self, just mistake-free in a lot of ways. And then the defense, I mean, Cam Ward's really kind of fallen apart since the UCLA game. This offense generally has kind of fallen apart yeah, since I said the UCLA the, game. Yeah, UCLA broke him. Yeah, and I think it's true. Um, he's back to just like it's a lot of dinking and dunking, a lot of attempts to dink and dunk, and it's just not pretty. 
Um, he ran the ball uh, for a couple of touchdowns in this game, but uh, they were not able to generate really much anything in the second half. Uh, ASU just really controlled this after halftime. Yep. Um, and look, I mean, ASU, they might not win another game this year. Like, they got to go at Utah, at UCLA, Oregon at home, Arizona at home. There, there's a pretty good chance they finish 2-10. and 10. But the last one, two, three, four, five games and – what I'm anticipating they'll show over the next four. Um, you know, I, I, I dogged on Kenny Dillingham for a lot of reasons, uh, mainly his love of train, but also uh, he's got the uh, the energy of, uh, well, of, a, of somebody with some severe, um, you know, psychosis issues. But uh, I think you got to be ex- excited about this if you're an ASU fan. Like, they've, they've with, with an undermanned team with some offensive line issues, they are playing their butts off yeah i think part of it just if you play hard yeah um you might not have the athletes you might not be able to do it all the time but i think this is an asu team that plays hard they should have more wins than they have but they're you know it's part of the building process and uh you know i give kenny dillingham a lot of credit because it looks like i mean there's holes but it looks like there's aspects of an experienced coach who kind of motivated guys to to play really hard play really well and they have, and they finally put it together. And we felt like this was a good spot at home. Um, you know, with Washington State coming in, not being their best. Uh, Arizona State was like efficient, right? Moving the ball, eight of 11 on third down conversions, uh, five trips to the red, just like Cal, five trips to the red zone, five touchdowns. Um, they were really good. Didn't turn the ball over. And there weren't any turnovers in this game. So it wasn't like ASU got turnover luck. They just outplayed them. Uh, and it was close in the first half, like three point game, um, and uh, you know then they you know were able to you know, didn't allow Washington State to score a touchdown in the second half. Um, you know they had Washington State got in the red zone six times, but only had three uh, three touchdowns and they had one turnover in there. So I thought they did a really nice job of like kind of getting the stops when they need to. When they had a, a drive going, they were able to finish off the drive and. It's just like it. That was like the mark of a good team. It looked like they knew what they were doing. At any point, you could have seen Washington State like kind of put it together and come back, and they just weren't able to do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, 121 yards rushing for Scadabo. That was good. Uh, like you said, Badger had his uh, third rushing career, touchdown of his career. This was, they needed this one. And I feel like this was a good spot. We didn't feel like they should be the underdog in this one. And, and uh, you know, they came up and, and they won it. Washington State, by the way, if we just want to do a quick little look ahead, yeah. they're four and four now. Are they going to make a bowl game? Well, so here's what they have remaining: Stanford at home should be a win. Like, yeah, even as weird as Washington State's looked in the last four games, again they've lost four straight, and uh, the closest one was UCLA. Um, then it's at Cal. I don't think that's a sure thing. In fact, I'd probably favor Cal right now. Then it's Col- can score, yeah. Colorado at home, which I think the same reasons that other teams have had an easy time scoring on Washington State and have been able to defend them better, I think Colorado's going to get that memo as well. And then at Washington. I mean, one more win seems pretty likely. Two more, I'm not sure about. And that's what they need for bowl eligibility at this point. Yeah. it's Things are suddenly looking dire for Washington State, and we were all... You know, they were 4-0 and and ranked in the top 15 at one point. Yeah. This is uh, crazy. Last two seasons, Washington State's 1-7 and in October. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Didn't win in October this year. Um, ASU had not really been running the ball. Uh, their first seven games, they were averaging 92 yards, uh, rushing yards per game, and eight rushing touchdowns total. Uh, against <laughs> Washington State, they had 235 rushing yards and five rushing touchdowns. Oh, yeah. So just really put it on them. Um, and when you can run the ball like that, like other people are going to look at that. And so, yeah, well, I mean, not that Washington State can't turn it around, but it's not looking very good when you're over four in, uh, in your last four games. It, it, it just seems like UCLA broke them. I, mean, I said that like one week after because I still had faith that Washington State could still be good, but they weren't. I forget what the game right afterwards. That was uh, Arizona. Yeah, Arizona just trucked them. And you're like, gosh, like UCLA just broke them. But then yeah. you play Oregon. Arizona State, they needed this one bad, and they weren't able to get it. Yep. Okay, uh, let's see. So that was our number 10 team. 
Uh, number nine team. Colorado Buffalo. Uh, they were in the Rose Bowl taking on number five. UCLA Bruins. <laughs> Uh, UCLA won 28 to 16. Uh, we did not cover this one because Colorado scored a meaningless touchdown late in the game Boo. to take it from 28, nine, a blessed cover, uh, to 28, 16, keeping my streak alive of six straight games for UCLA where I have not picked correctly against the spread. And lest you think I'm just picking UCLA to cover over and over. No, 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 no. I'm not every single time I pick them to cover. They don't every single time I pick them to lose against the spread. They don't. It's just the way it is. Um, kind of a deceptive final score, not just because uh, it was a meaningless touchdown at the end. Uh, UCLA, so turnover luck is a thing. Um, yeah. And people, when they talk about it, they they sometimes think, oh, you're making sour grapes and all that kind of stuff, whatever. There were three fumbles in this game, two by UCLA, one by Colorado. All three were covered by Colorado. Those are 50-50s. Uh, UCLA had seven PBUs in this game. That means they got their hands on seven balls from Shadour Sanders. They intercepted none of them. Colorado had one PBU in this game and two interceptions. So they got their hands on three UCLA balls and intercepted two of them. That's a very high rate, and UCLA's is very low. Uh, the turnovers ended up being UCLA had four and Colorado had zero, um, which would not be your expectation based on the underlying stats of the game. Ergo, turnover luck was favoring Colorado. Uh, UCLA drove the ball pretty easily on Colorado, as you might have expected, um, but just didn't score. And then uh, they also missed a field goal, which uh, wouldn't have been significant for the final spread, but may have uh, led to some different outcomes. They missed a field goal at the end of the first half. Uh, anyway, so the main storyline here was that UCLA's defense did more or less what you would expect it to do against a Colorado offense that was A, one-dimensional, and B, very bad at protecting the passer. Uh, Shador Sanders was sacked seven times, uh, was under pressure on more than half of his dropbacks, uh, was hit, I think, over 20 times, knocked down over 10 times. Um, he had a very tough time. I think uh, Deion Sanders said he got a shot at halftime, some injection uh, to numb the pain. Um, so that's that's not great. Uh, the UCLA front seven was also able to shut down what is a very bad Colorado rushing attack, but any... Any any version of this game that would have involved Colorado actually winning would have necessitated them having a running attack uh, because the only way to beat UCLA's defense is to make it defend both things. Um, and Colorado wasn't able to do that. So it was, it was the Shadur Sanders show. And once again, he's probably the most accurate quarterback in the Pac-12, but um, they started out short passing and it was working okay. And then the passes could not even get out quick enough for the short passing game. After a while, you see like tighten things up on the outside a little bit. Um, and the end result was he was just getting drilled over and over and over and over again. Um, and they weren't allowing him running lanes either. So Colorado really couldn't drive the ball at all. And then UCLA eventually stopped uh, shooting itself on its feet and scored 28 points. And that was more than enough. Uh, we had a comment uh, from uh, DJ. Cry me a river. Excuses, excuses. Great teams cover. DJ, you're so right. You're so right. I say it all the time. Um, and most importantly, I, I need would to say it, but it cost me the, the parlay. So, it's so here's the thing. I'm, I'm beginning to like try to think metaphysically about the way I pick UCLA games now because I, I'm trying to figure out like a theory of like how this all works. Is it my pick that is dictating the result? Or do I need to somehow like go opposite my true thinking? But how do I know it's my true thinking? Yes, right. This is know, like this is like a theory of knowledge idea, right? Where how do I know that that is actually the way I think if I then think opposite of that is the way to go? Like, do I have to go with entire because some of this is facts, some of it's just like gut instinct, all that kind of stuff. So it's not like some I'm using only numbers to figure this stuff out. So at what point do I know that my true thinking has ended? And so then I can go opposite it to pick the UCLA game correctly. Mm. Right? Yeah. Because obviously I'm wrong. The question is, yes. am I wrong because of my thinking? Or does my pick actually dictate the outcome? Does, does me picking this, does it have like an actual effect on the game's outcome? I'm hoping it does because I'm definitely going to pick opposite. But you see, you see what my problem is, right? Yeah. 
because on one end I can I can change a little bit, but on the other end I'm doomed to fail no matter what. Right. Yeah. So it's it's a tough it's a tough situation for me. Um, I appreciate everyone out there, um, you know, uh, believing in me, and uh, I rest assured. I feel very confident that I'm going to finish the year one and ten against the spread <laughs> on regular season UCLA games. Uh, you know, Colorado ran for 38 yards. Yeah. yeah. I don't know advanced stats as well, but doesn't seem good. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. And, you know, like, they weren't running the ball a lot. Like, true runs, I think it was – yeah, they, they they finished with 11 true runs uh, between That's Hankerson, tough. Wilkerson, Edwards, and McCaskill. They didn't even really try, and I think they understood they were not going to get anything. Um, oh, we have a good – Amy says uh, – let me put this up here. It should be like The Princess Bride. You should. Uh, it sounds like the Princess Bride movie. Choosing the cup, which cup has the poison? Yeah, that's the true. Iocane poison. Right. Um, says it doesn't matter which one because he. But Vizzini's <laughs> setting up. You know, he's setting it up for um, doing the the trickeration with the cups. I, I I don't have a trick in my bag. I I don't I don't know how to figure this one out. Yeah. I, I this is this feels more like a, a a Schrodinger's cat situation where I just you know, you know. There's metaphysics involved, is my point. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you do have to pick somebody, so I can just pick the opposite, and it should work out well. Yeah, no, exactly. No matter what, I'm going to continue to fail here. I just want to know what exact way of failing it is. Yeah. You know, whether is this a Calvinist situation? Am I predestined to failure? Mm. Like, was this written? Am I just not at the... Uh, like, I, I don't have any control over the switch, right? Like, this is going to happen one way or the other. Or are we going like old school Catholic where I can, you know, I can change some things, you know? Yeah. Uh, I can't believe I like went with you for my parlay. I didn't even think I did. And I looked, I was like, oh, I won my parlay. I'm like, oh crap, I included UCLA in my parlay? No way. Yeah, that was stupid. That, that was, was dumb. That was stupid. That was my own choice. I didn't yeah. need to do that. I won't do that uh, going forward. Uh, Matthew says, never go up against a Sicilian when death is on the line, but always go up against David when UCLA has a line. Yeah, that was nice. That was good. I like that, Matthew. Uh, very cool. Okay, anything else on this game? Um, no, no. It, it wasn't very interesting because um, it was sort of like UCLA, like at whatever point they decided to stop fucking around was going to be where they won the game by double digits. Right. And it didn't happen until halftime. No, uh, it was, yeah, this was a little frustrating. But to watch, knowing that I'd picked UCLA to cover a big spread, and they mm -hmm. just did mm -hmm. not look interested mm -hmm. in covering it from yeah, the very yeah. beginning. Totally, you could tell, like, like, oh, like Oregon looks like they're going to score a bunch of points. They're going to cover this. UCLA did not look like they were like, oh, we're going to try to win, but not by seventeen. They turned the ball over four times in the first half. <laughs> so bad. Um, okay, so that was uh, what number nine. Yeah. Uh, Number eight. Oh, we already covered them. Uh, number seven, we haven't covered yet. Utah Utes. And uh, they're taking on our new number one team. Oregon Ducks. Uh, yeah, at a certain point, your pig farmer turns into a pig farmer, right? Mm. That's the lesson here, isn't it? I think he was pig farmery. Yeah. I mean, he farmed some pigs. Uh, I don't want to belabor this one. Uh, Utah is... Um, look, what they've done this year, I think, is borderline incredible. Um, to be at 6-2 and two at this point with some of the wins they've had is nuts. Uh, but they're down to, like, nobody. Like, they're playing the pig farmer at quarterback, and he's, like, a guy who's good enough to beat an Alex Grinch defense, certainly. And that's pretty good, right? Because nobody, you know, nobody can do that. You, you, you can't just your, you kind of screwed yourself there. You can't just you can't just roll off the bus and beat an Alex Grinch defense. So he's better than you know uh, your Garden Variety quarterback, but he's not Cam Rising. Um, their running game, you know, Sandy Vaki, uh, he was finally uh, shut down by somebody. Um, you know, somebody who I think. Alex Grinch made a great sacrifice for the other teams on on Utah's schedule because he put a lot on film, right? That wasn't previously there, like wheel routes. Who knew those existed, right? Um, and because of his great sacrifices, uh, Oregon knew. Oregon knew what was going to happen, and they were prepared to defend it. Uh, I mean, the main thing is Oregon's really friggin' good, um, and they were able to do defensively what 
teams sh- good teams should do to Utah, which is limit what is a offense full of limited players. You've got a limited quarterback. You've got a running back room where it's mostly guys converted from other positions and Jalen Glover. Um, and you know, they don't have their big tight ends. They don't have, they don't have the things that make Utah's offense, uh, Utah. Uh, and then defensively, I mean, look, Oregon's offense is just really good. And, uh, you know, Bucky Irving's really good. Bo Nix, um, is running that offense really well. And so the end result is they put up 35 points. That's under Oregon's average. Uh, so there's that, but they also called off the dogs in the fourth quarter. Uh, this was a resounding blowout, uh, probably one of the most dominant wins in the Pac-12 this year, uh, most impressive wins in the Pac-12 this year, Oregon going on the road to Rice Eccles and winning uh, this in this fashion. Uh, we both picked this very, very wrong, um, but uh, kudos to Oregon. Uh, this is one of the big reasons they are our number one team this week. Yeah, uh, we did have this one wrong. This was the only one we really got like wrong, wrong, um, where we weren't covering or whatever. This was just a blowout from the beginning. You thought it might be a chance, first play of the game, Oregon gets a false start. You're like, oh, the must is going crazy. Utah is going to be fired up. And then they drove down the field. Yeah, then they scored a touchdown. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bucky Irving fumbled. Yeah. Oregon's first fumble of the season. Didn't matter. No. Nope. Um, Utah didn't score a freaking touchdown. Remember I was complaining they only scored one touchdown, offensive touchdown against UCLA and one against Yeah, I remember that Oregon insane State. complaint. Yes. They didn't score any yeah. in this one. Uh, and this one was at home. But yeah, Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? They're starting a pig farmer at quarterback. It's true, but he looked pretty good. Against USC. He could look good in some other games, but USC made him look really good. Sioni Vaki, he looked good a couple games, yeah. especially good against USC. No, uh, Oregon shot him down. Dave's like, nope, we're not letting a safety beat us. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, I thought the pig farmer, like looking at it early, like I don't know if Utah wasn't like interested in running, but he was like hucking it around. Like, did you, I mean, just watching the game, it was just like, he's dropping back. This wasn't like they're running, you know, little crossings or whatever, just something like screens, draw, like something to sort of get him going. It was like drop back, throw the ball into, you know, deep into coverage. And it was like, this isn't Aaron Rodgers. Like, this is your pig farmer. Like, you got to like run this offense that's not going to be him dropping back, surveying the field and, you know, hitting his third read. It just felt like that's what they were doing kind of early on in this one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Utah only got in the red zone twice, both field goals. Uh, just weren't able to get anything going. Uh, Oregon was pretty efficient. Um, half their third downs, five trips to the red zone, five touchdowns. Like, they weren't going to let Utah's defense stop them. They, once they got things rolling on a drive, they punched it in. And uh, it was, How much of this do you think was just the body blow effect for Utah? You know, they'd had to go against a really, really – really tough defense the previous week um and it's just you know how do you do that again it's tough you know um Uh, i mean but i think a lot of this was sort of smoke and mirrors right like you sort of like okay like if ucla wasn't playing dante more does utah win that game if usc had like any sort of defense and maybe not seeing sione vaki on film catching wheel routes i mean this was a team that just, you know, they, I think they were kind of fortunate to be where they were, but you have to give tons of credit to Utah because they were there. They were like, you know, you got game day coming. They won games. You didn't think they were going to win, but then it all kind of came crashing down and yeah. Oregon was just like, we're not messing around. Um, There's another token to look at it too, which is like, you shouldn't prep for a big game by um, playing, you know, at least on one side of the ball, Patsy the previous week. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't prepare you. Like, Sione Vaki being able to, like, juke an entire secondary and just run the other way when he's running full speed one way, like, that doesn't prepare you for going against a defense that's, like, you know, competent in some way. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, really impressive uh, win by the Ducks. It's their largest margin of victory in a road game over a ranked opponent since they beat Iowa 44-6 to back in uh, 1989. Damn. That was a long time ago. Um, their 18 home game winning streak snapped the first home loss since 2020, but it really been that was a non that was a COVID year. Um, so they had really it's been a while since Utah lost in front of fans uh, in Salt Lake City, and uh, this was not just a loss; it was just a drubbing. 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. That's all I got for that one. Anything else? No, no, I'm good. Okay. So we had uh, six was USC, five was UCLA. And then our number four team. Oregon State Beavers. Uh, they went to the desert where many hopes go to die. David, uh, taking on our number three team. Arizona Wildcats. Wow. We have them ranked for every loss. They get a they get a ranking, so they're number three. Uh, once again, as predicted, uh, Arizona team home dog. We, we predicted a win. We we both got this one. I uh, in my picks column, I predicted this exact score. I saw that. So you tweeted that. Twenty seven, twenty four, Arizona. Um, you know, there's there was a lot in this game. First, I would say uh, from a competitive standpoint, one of the best games of the year in the Pac-12. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The, the depressed scoring outcome needs to be understood in the context of heading into the fourth quarter, Arizona had had a total of five offensive drives. Like when these teams had the ball, they were maintaining it for like four and a half minutes on average. Uh, and there were a lot of six minute drives in this game. Um, so it just, it was 13 to 10 or it was, yeah, 13 to 10 right after halftime, but it was, this was actually like a really competitive and like decently scoring game. It wasn't like a defensive struggle the whole way. It's just, it was a lot of methodical, efficient drives. Um, like Arizona scored on one, two, three, four, five of its one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight drives that were real drives, not the end of the game. Um, so they were, you know, they were scoring okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot. I mean, DJU started the game really hot, and then he went, like, I want to say, like, one of ten in the middle stretches of this game, just looking like a struggle fest. And this has been kind of a commonality, and they called it out on the broadcast. Aiden Childs coming in as just, like, a rote thing on the third drive of the game seems to fuck up DJ, like, at a pretty regular pace. Like, it seems like every time he comes into the game, back it into it. It doesn't help. It doesn't look like it helps him at all. Um, it's almost like a piano was falling <laughs> from the sky. <laughs> Speaking of pianos, uh, Jonathan Smith called his first time out of the second half with about, I think it was like nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter, coming out of a dead ball, starting a drive. Wow. That was cool. Uh, it didn't matter, though. Why would it have mattered? Were they trying to make a comeback late in this game and they would have needed another timeout to preserve more time on the clock, potentially, if they got a stop? Oh, right, right. That was the exact situation that he prevented. Well, it was happening. a lot of possession games, right? So you, yeah. you figure there's a lot of possessions. <laughs> you don't need those timeouts. Yeah. Um, so for Arizona, I think one thing that's very deceptive when you look at the stat line uh, is their running, uh, their rushing yards because they iced this game on the ground. Like, this was an insane drive. Uh, it was their um, their drive to go up 27-17. to 17. DJ Williams ran for 6 yards, 5 yards, 14 yards. Then Jonah Coleman got in on it. 9 yards, 2 yards. They got to the Oregon State 20... Uh, to the Oregon State 19, just purely running the ball, taking the clock down to, like, under 4 minutes with just pure running. Like, when this mattered, DJ Williams was awesome. Uh, Jonah Coleman was great. Uh, and so, you know, they ran for, I think the end total was like 88 yards. It felt like every single one of those came on that last drive uh, to put him in the end zone. Um, and then Noah Fafita, I thought, played a really good game. Uh, he hit Michael Wiley on a couple of balls, these kind of quick balls out of the backfield um, that were critical. Um, one was uh, the late touchdown. But there was another one that was, um, uh, it was I think it was the touchdown before the go-ahead touchdown to go from 17-13 uh, to 20-17, uh, where he just hits him. Like, he's backing up, and he just hits him on, like, a little go out of the backfield to beat the defense. Um, it was a really well-called game. I think Jed Fish is fully over the concussive effects of the piano falling in his head a few weeks ago against USC. Um, but Arizona, they just look good. I mean, that's that's really, you know, you know, we've joked about Arizona, but um, they look sound on both sides of the ball. I mean, their defense played really well in this game, and their offense is very good. Uh, and with Noah Fafita there, they're not, they're not doing the catastrophic dumb things that, you know, Jaden Delora is prone to. Um, they're mostly just making the plays that the offense gives them. Um, and there was just a lot really good in this game. Uh, Arizona uh, beat them, and um, you know it wasn't like Oregon State played bad. 
it's just two good teams and the home team won. End of the first half, um, Oregon State, I believe, had two timeouts left. And they get a first down with like 25 seconds left. Mm -hmm. Yes. They snapped the ball with, they at least took 10 of the seconds off. I think it was 11 seconds they, before they snapped the ball. Instead of calling timeout and trying to do something, um, it's now, then there, it was two or three seconds they were down to. Mm -hmm. They could kick the field goal. Now, yes. This, like you'd mentioned. So, of course, they kicked it, right? No. You'd mentioned a lot of these. You know, there's fewer possessions in this game. So mm -hmm. points are certainly at a premium. Right, right. So certainly you take the points at that point, right? Yeah. It's fourth. Or, no. do you, or are, are you talking about a thrown Hail Mary, something like that? No. Fourth and short. They ran not even a pass play. They ran a running fake field goal where, what were they, at like the 20? Like, this wasn't like you had to pick up three yards, which they did. Like, if it was like in the middle of the first quarter and you ran this fake field goal... You would have picked up the first down. It would have been great. But literally, you ran all the t The only way this works is if he runs all the way for a touchdown. Like, he would be running for 15 yards with the time at zero. So, the piano went from Tucson to Corvallis. Did they, but did they put in, like, a running back at kicker, at least? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was bad. Kyle says the fact that they... No, no, wait, sorry, sorry. It was some motherfucker named Atticus Sappington <laughs> trying to run this thing? That's who ran it. Kyle said the fact that they tried to run the fake earlier in the game and were flagged, and they still tried to run it before halftime. That was, like, I like fake something, but that the only way that works is if you have to run it all the way in for a touchdown. Like, there's no... I, I It didn't make any sense. Like, if you're throwing a pass, but you're run, you got to run all the way through... Every, I mean, there's someone could accidentally be in your way. Like, it just didn't seem like it was smart. No, no. I think smart would be the opposite of that. Um, yeah, I mean, like, look, Oregon State's a really good team. Um, it's just they – they. I like Jonathan Smith a lot as a coach, but he – he does. He's done a couple. Everyone of, does dumb stuff. He does. He's done a couple of things, but like in a broad-based way this year that I just find very questionable. Damian Martinez does not carry the ball enough. They and they've done that all year, and they don't run the ball enough. Like I, I will like eat my words a little bit on DJU, but you're you're not trying to make him shoulder your load the entire way through. Mm. Like this is a running offense, and it should be a running offense, and that should be like perceptions of balance like they should be at like a 60 40 split at minimum uh run pass like it it should be martinez had 14 carries 87 yeah. yards and like average over six yards a carry and yes a low possession low play game but that's only he's touching the ball then let me see how many catches he had any one all right so he touched the ball 15 times on 62 offensive plays yeah, that's not enough that. no. it's not enough for your best player and he is your best player and it's not like by a short like little bit it's by a pretty wide margin get the ball in his hands there was a lot of evenness like oregon state six of 12 on third down arizona five of 11 this is oregon state's third time that they lost with a game decided by three points or fewer like you're losing those really really close ones you know like Oh. Could, could could the decision to like kick the field goal made a difference? Yes, obviously. Well, and somebody's making the point, and I saw this point made yesterday that like um, if uh, Uncle Phil Liffy, uh that I'll if put it up there. if uh, I think it's supposed to be Uncle Filthy, maybe um, uh, that if there had been one extra block. But if you watch the all twenty two of that play, the problem isn't the blocking. It's the kicker running the ball. Like, if the kicker had running back instincts, like if you were just running an offensive play, look, if you want to defend, like, oh, we're going to just run a play and try to score a touchdown. Like, hand it to Damian Martinez. Fine. What the hell? <laughs> um, what the hell? What, what are we doing here? We're all trying to have fun. Um, but the kicker doesn't have running back instincts because there's a lane. If he just – if he shifts his hips – about five yards earlier and goes outside instead of kind of curling inside, which he then has to too late try to go outside, he might have scored. But he's a kicker. He's a guy named Atticus Sappington. <laughs> you can't expect him to read blocks and be like, oh, yeah, I got this. No, you don't run that play from that far out. You just don't. Yeah. Um, no, turn Oregon State didn't turn the ball over. Arizona only one turnover. Yeah. Um, Pretty crazy, but uh, T Mac, 
he had a receiving touchdown, 80 yards. Cowing had uh, not a, kind of a slow night, six receptions for 36 yards. But, you know, DJ was fine. He was like 16 to 30 for 218 yards, a couple touchdowns. Um, it just was – it was just one of those little back and forth ones. Big win though for for Jed Fish. Um, gets the literally the piano off of his head, and uh, gives it to Jonathan Smith. <laughs> um, unfortunately for him. Okay, uh, let's take a quick break. We'll come back and answer questions. Back in a minute. Um, well, I teased this earlier. How do we not go right to Zodiac Killer? Zodiac Killer. Like, it's funny when I listen to the voicemails because, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, am I going to like, you know, wake up one morning and like pull off the sheets and then there's like a guy sitting there with a knife or chainsaw or brass knuckles or something. And it's like... Hello, Ryan. You you picked against Stanford for the last time. I'm waiting for that to happen. You That'd know, be fun. It would be yeah. I guess, I guess that would be a good way to go. Yeah. You know, uh, one of our callers just kills me in my sleep. Uh, okay, here he is. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Sith Lord Dave. That's right. It's me, the resident Stanford fan. Well, well, well. What an interesting week we have here. I'm sitting here pontificating following a, an absolutely splendid showing. Nothing to be, nothing to hang our heads about. The beloved, my beloved Stanford Cardinal. What a great competitive performance. One play away, just one. But here's my question, Ryan. Who should feel buddier? B U T T I E R. Uh, Stan you say Stanford's butt, but who should feel buttier? The USC fan base or the Stanford fan base? Cite your sources, support your answers. Keep it mediocre, boys. I like what he said. It's, and he was about to say Zodiac Killer, your resident Stanford fan. <laughs> I was like, it's like, I'm not going to admit to being the Zodiac Killer or something. Uh, who should be buddier, feel buddier? I mean, Stanford's pretty butt. Like, they're USC was up 49 to 3 on them. Well, so it's but, a. Um, but USC's I, probably going to get, you know. I'm trying to remember my micro. There's a couple bad ones coming up. I'm trying to remember my microeconomics. I think uh, from an absolute butt standpoint, it's Stanford. Absolute obviously. butt. But from a comparative butt standpoint, like a relative butt or a compar comparative? Okay. Yeah. Like comparative butt, I think it's USC. I think that's fair. Relative to expectations, uh, it's USC. Yeah. I don't think Zodiac Killer liked our expectations for Stanford, which was butt. Uh, they they ha have they have met my expectations Let's of see. being asked. Let asshole. me see what I picked Stanford to do. Let's see. I had... Uh, where is Stanford? I had them beating Sacramento State. And uh, I'm losing to everybody else. So I think I had him at two and ten. Yeah, I think you're going to be on. I have him one at eleven. So I, I guess I was a little buddier in my predictions than you. Yeah, I would say that's fair. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, there's there's an argument for and against uh, Stanford being asshole. Um, but they're not good. No, they're. Th I, I think we can all agree that they are not good. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, is there another voicemail or is that it? Uh, we have, we have one more, um, here, do, let's do an email, which, where email are we starting with? I'm looking, um, we did rushing the field. Did we do we did Evans? I think we did who stays longer or no, maybe we didn't. Oh, we did do that. We did that. Okay. Uh, and there's a text message. This is okay. I'll get that. Okay. Dear Dave and Ryan, can the Utes please put that dumbass professor in the game to return a punt so she can get the Evan Williams hit stick treatment? I don't know who this is. Oh, is it the one who was being protested against? I think well, no. I think the Utah professor, <laughs> the one that advised the Pac-12 to take fifty million a year and no less. Oh, right. I think that's what. Right. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, sorry for leaving <laughs> a three-minute voicemail, even though you did read some. Okay. Sorry. Um, whoever this is, uh, the five four one number. Your voicemail was insanely garbled. It wasn't the length, though 
three minutes is pushing it. Um, Way pushing it. It was super garbled. We we couldn't suss out what it was being said. I think the service might have been bad, but we didn't get the actual text of it at yeah, all. Yeah, it'll tell us, like, it'll give us a transcription that's usually fairly terrible, but this one had nothing. It was just so I tried bad. to listen to it even, and there was, like, just a huge dead spot in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, should I read Soul Cows? Yes, please. He, uh, F star 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 Wilcox. Mm. What would that mean? Um, for Wilcox or go Wilcox, uh, yeah, maybe something like that from Wilcox or, okay. I'm not sure what it means, but, uh, before the game started, I knew we'd lose, uh, so Cal, you can't blame us. We picked Cal, um, Cal started being cute and playing tomfoolery and turnovers happened. Wilcox, that P O S what is that? We're, we're the podcast of. POC is podcast of champions. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. What I wouldn't call him a POC. No, I don't know what POS is. But anyway, interesting. Why go for two? Okay, I I like going for two. Uh, I get out. I get out the game away. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. But you have four running backs out. Just play into OT. Oh, I get put the game away. But you have four running backs out. Here's oh yeah, no, yeah. put the game away. Um, that's not what he wrote. Uh. But yeah, the, you're arguing if you have four running backs out, that's why you go for two. You know, like you try to. If you're yeah, if you're the undermanned team, you go for two because you don't want the game to extend. If you have a chance to win as a dog on a single play, that was better than any chance you had coming in. Yeah. So take it. I agree. He said you might be able to win that way with four plays. Horrible decision, and we lose to that POS. Here's that term again. USC, and our series is over. A hundred years ends. With a W in their hands. Someone get that dumb hillbilly Wilcox out of my stadium and life. I'm tired of his dumb face. This is a loss for USC as as much as it is for us. As she should, as they should not be ranked. Undeserved. F my life. Steady golden POS Bears. Story of my fanhood with them. Soul Cow. I need to go back and look at Soul Cow's emails. Because I want to say before the season, they're a little bit they cocky. They were like this. A little bit cocky. Maybe. Um, we, we is it time? Him. Is it time yet to revisit our preseason expectations for teams? Oh, we can do it at the end. What do you mean the end? Like at the end of the season. I just wanted to say right now, um, I'm trending towards a lot better than you. Are you? Yeah. You had ASU six and six preseason. Yeah, I thought they'd be better. I have them at four and eight. You had Arizona six and six. I have seven and five. Okay. We each had Cal three and nine. You had Colorado two and ten. I had them five and seven. Yeah. Oregon, you had nine and three. I had ten and two. Okay. Now here's a real one. Oregon State, you had ten and two. I had eight and four. Yeah, you thought they were going to drop off, and they have. Yeah. Uh, Stanford, one and eleven, two and ten. UCLA, nine and three, nine and three. USC, you had eleven and one. I had ten and two. So that'll be better. <laughs> we're both going to be wrong. Uh, Utah, eight and four. We both had. Okay. Washington, you had eleven and one. I had ten and two. We'll see. And Washington State, we each had five and seven. You know, I would say my main takeaway there, what? we did a pretty good job. Not bad. Like, yeah. we're in the, you know, ASU, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll see. We're, it's not terrible. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, we need to get Soul Cal and uh, the Zodiac Killer together. Yeah, that'd be fun. All right, you ready for Cousin Eddie? Sure. Is UW a delayed USC? Lifetime UW fan and alum, but I try to be realistic. Something has fundamentally changed with UW on both sides of the ball since beating Oregon. I get the sinking feeling that UW is USC on a two-week delay, and I'm about to see a giant collapse. Is it injuries, or do they just suddenly suck? I'm in the fourth quarter of the Stanford game and have drank a lot for what it's worth. <laughs> um, I th don't think they're USC. I think USC for... Um, USC was like pure paper tiger for like how many weeks before they actually lost to Notre Dame? Were they looking bad? Yeah, a couple. They were like, they like not ASU. They looked good against Colorado the first half and then looked bad in the second half. But here's the thing. USC hadn't played a good team until right. Notre Dame. UW has demonstrably played a good team, Oregon, and beat them. Well, they, um, they beat Arizona, which we didn't think was a good team, but they actually are. And that's good. turned out, and that's a good road win now. Um, so you've got those two games where it's like they did something that USC still hasn't done, which is beat a good team. And yeah. They did it twice. So, no, I don't think it's the same thing. Now, what's going on with them right now may be 
uh, you know, some of that. I, I, my belief is that it's more of like kind of a hangover effect thing. It's hard to get up for these games that are just kind of against dog shit opponents or what you expect to be dog shit opponents, ASU and then Stanford. I'm expecting to see a very amped up and fired up UW against USC this weekend. Uh, I think it'll be a competitive game, though. Um, I don't think either of these defenses are that great. And I think um, for all that Stanford was able to do it, I think USC will also be able to do it against this UW defense. I think it's going to be a shootout. But I expect Washington to come in guns blazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think it'll be a really good game. I, I wouldn't be we surprised. We just haven't seen Washington guns blazing, but I feel like they will be for this game. Yeah, we haven't seen it in a little while now. Um, no. So anyway, I don't think it's similar. I think uh, Washington is having, you know, what a lot of teams do, which is like having a little bit of a lull in the middle of the season when, you know, the, you you try to get up for a game against Stanford. Like, come on. Dozens of people in the crowd. Yeah, like, come on. Um, so... I wouldn't get too worried yet if you're a uh, Washington fan. You are, uh, and I, I do need to reiterate this, you are, in fact, undefeated. Yes. You get to play a USC team that's been giving up a ton of points. You want to get your offense right. That's a good opportunity there. Uh, I think Utah, you get at home. Like, yeah, who's Washington's schedule like coming up? You got USC, Utah at home, Oregon State, you know, they're tough on the road. I mean, could my 10-2 and two still happen? Absolutely. Like, they could absolutely lose to USC and Oregon State, but they're not going to lose to Utah at home, and they're not going to lose to Washington State at home. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So, and if it's 10-2 and two at the end of the year, please maintain your heads, Washington fans, uh, and just remember how you felt two years ago during the last dregs of the Jimmy Lake era. There you go. Uh, Greg wrote in, piano pandemic. Is there a piano pandemic? And why are they targeting Pac-12 football coaches? Jonathan Smith had his fall on his head before halftime. Thanks, Greg. So we kind of talked yeah, about that. No, there's been a, there's been a, 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 we're trying to get to the bottom of it. Um, but we had some grand pianos, some real, <laughs> real Steinways falling on some people. All right. Uh, this is Fred in Sarasota. Riley is not going to the NFL. Coaches in the NFL have to be, have to, coaches in the NFL have to be able, I'm assuming, yes, to fire ineffective coaches promptly. Riley has demonstrated to NFL owners that he can't do that. No, come on. So here's the thing. I'm, mm. I'm joking mostly about the NFL stuff, but I do think he's going to get some interest. And uh, if he has interest in going, there, there will be a match. There, there will. Um, you know, I think just because it didn't quite work out for Cliff Kingsbury doesn't mean that people aren't still looking for the next, uh, you know, whatever, Sean McVay or whatever the hell it would be. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if he's interested in the challenge, I, I think there would be suitors. Uh, yeah, I agree. We'll see. My guess is he's sticking around, but we'll see. Uh, we have a voicemail. Let me play it for you. Uh, good afternoon, Mario and Luigi. It's your BFF, Alan in St. Louis. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines the sunk cost fallacy as a phenomenon whereby a person is reluctant to abandon the strategy or course of action because they've invested heavily in it, even when it is clear that abandonment would be more beneficial. Under examples, the Oxford English Dictionary says, C.E.G. Alex fucking Grinch. <laughs> Why is Captain Clown Shoes still calling the shots for this defense? They're already ranked 111th in the country. What's the worst that could happen? They drop to 130th? <gasps> Excuse me while I clutch my pearls and paint in a chaise lounge. Not trying to go all math nerd on you guys. But there's arithmetically no reason to not just fire this guy and promote Greg Brown, Sean Nua, or Jake from State Farm. They quite literally can't do much worse, but the upside is asymmetrically huge. Anyway, keep farming them pigs. Alan St. Louis. Thanks, Alan. Um, Good stuff. So, yeah. So just to give you a little, uh, just a little insight into USC's defense this year, because I like advanced stats. You know this about me. Yeah. I don't do the total yardage, all that bullshit. In the preseason projections in the SP+, Plus, USC was projected to have the 47th best defense in the country. Right now, it's 71st. They have underperformed that metrics. Um, and it, again, it changes week by week. Like the expectation changes week by week as they underperform. They have underperformed the, the projection in the SP+, Plus in terms of points given up in... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of nine weeks this season. Yeah. The only one in which they did not underperform was Stanford. 
Oh, I thought it'd be Notre Dame. No, no, no. Interesting. Yeah, they're they're giving up a lot of points. And Stanford butt. Stanford's asshole. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, USC is really, really, really bad on defense, and I think, um, you know, jokes aside, if they don't. <laughs> Like Alex Grinch should be fired. It's one of those midseason firings that you have to offer as like a sacrificial lamb, also to keep. This is one of those things where you're failing a tone uh, uh, test here, which is you're not measuring your fan base correctly if you're Lincoln Riley. Where I think if you made the sacrifice right now and you said, "Look, we made a mistake. You know, we gotta we gotta move on from this guy and we gotta try something different," any positive result in the next few games would be looked at very fondly yes. first and that's number one and number two you would you would you would significantly knock down the temperature of the conversation and i'm not saying lincoln Riley's on the hot seat he's not and he wouldn't be but it reduces the potential for you to be on the hot seat say next year or the year after that if you start making choices now proactively and you don't look like you're embattled and trying to be defensive and all this kind of stuff, just say, no, this isn't working. You know, I thought we were going to do some better things and that's on me, but we got to make a change now because this isn't working. Uh, and say that frankly because people aren't stupid. And USC fan in particular uh, uh, prides himself on his discerning ability to understand what's going on on a football field. And traditionally on the defensive side of the ball for a USC fan, uh, so telling them, oh, this is actually we're only a, a player two away, that that's going to drive your fans insane. So it stop is. doing that. Well, and Iowa just fired uh, Brian Ferenc, the uh, the nepotistic offensive coordinator. So he's going to be gone after the year. When they made it clear he wasn't going to be, you know, they're not going to get to the twenty five point a game, which we all thought was just too easy to get to, and they still didn't. No, it close. was it was beautifully set actually in retrospect. It was like. We're going to set this so low. There's no way you can't. Oh, nope. You're not even close to getting it. Um, so, yeah. So, the AD had to put out a statement because the head coach can't fire him because it's his son. So, the AD has to be his direct report because of the nepotistic crap. Like, if if this is what you got to do, you probably shouldn't have this guy. Um, but, yes. And that's going to get Iowa. And Iowa still has a lot to play for. Mm. Could, they did lose this last week. But they're 6-2. and two. Like, they could still win their crappy division and play someone really good and get smoked in the big 10 championship game. So I think this gives Iowa fans some hope that they're going to have something better than, you know, nine points per game, you know, next year. But I feel, I think you're right. Like if Lincoln Riley would fire Alex Grinch now, I think fans would be a lot more excited. All right. We can do one more and then I got to run. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to read Jared or actually, sorry, fuck you. Yeah. What is more hilarious? Dear Ryan and Davy Crockett Irving Woods, after the weekend, what is more hilarious to you? Alex Grinch is still employed. Justin Wilcox is still employed. Lan Danning is now Kyle Whittingham's daddy. Wazoo is cooging it like only Wazoo can cook it. All the best. Fuck you. Obviously, for me, the most hilarious is that Alex Grinch is still employed. It's pretty funny, but I, I would say I didn't think he'd be fired during the season. I don't think Wilcox would at all. I'm maybe more I, mean, I don't think it's funny that Wazoo's cooking it, but it's very interesting. I'm surprised that Wazoo's I'm intrigued it. by it, yes. Yeah. More than sort of anything. All right, you gotta go. Yep, yep. Okay. Well David's gotta go because he doesn't feel like this is an important podcast to him. <laughs> can we make how many super chats do we get? Oh god, we got so many. None. Oh, we didn't get a single dollar from all of you freeloaders. Yeah. Uh that's not cool. We no. do have over 100 people watching. Not one of you? Just gonna stand Not one of them. Are you kidding? Not one of them. That, well, we're just going to have to end the show then. Cause All right. Well, see David, you guys later. Yeah. Um, for, Another time, maybe. For David David Woods, I'm Ryan Abert. What kind of – do you want to pose for the end of this? Or? Hang on. All right, what, what are you going to do? Should I do that too? Yeah. All right. Uh, for David David Woods. <laughs> I'm Ryan Amer. If you're listening on the podcast, we just uh, put our chins to our fists and looked into the air as if trying to discern if a piano was going to fall on our heads or not. Uh, that's David Woods. I'm Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show, and we will talk to you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>